Hi everyone, welcome back to the photo book review. This time on the channel, we're going to be looking at Joel Sternfeld's book, Sweet Earth. Um, this book investigates utopian societies as they've popped up across the United States, but specifically how the societies are connected with the landscape, either through uh, utopian communities that are religiously based or politically based, um, economically based, uh, so it's fascinating to see how different distinct groups of people make specific connections with the landscape. The book also talks about freedom of conscience and, and um, the country being uh, a place where that can happen in these distinct uh, set apart communities. Um, thank you for tuning in the past uh, few videos. These videos are ones that I recorded. Uh, the last few have been ones that I recorded. Uh, two or three months ago, and I'm finally getting around now to uh, uh, to publish them. So thanks for tuning in. Uh, like, share, and subscribe. Um, we've had an awesome growth of followers or subscribers lately, so I appreciate it. But all right, let's get to it. Uh, Joel Sternfeld is a really interesting photographer because he is a landscape photographer. Um, not so much interested in picturesque scenes, but how landscape and people interact. Now, that sounds vague, but um, I think what he's getting at in his work is the dynamic between people and landscape, how people connect to it in a political or social or cultural kind of way. What you notice first about this book is that it's got a very different cover. <laughs> um, so this is a cover that libraries put on books sometimes, when a book cover has worn out or been damaged, but it's been rebound, and this one's pretty, pretty bland, <laughs> uh, unfortunately, for a really interesting book. Uh, also, before we start out looking through, sweet, uh, this book is called Sweet Earth. It is about utopian societies, and so you can kind of see now how Joel Sternfeld, who's interested in landscape and photography, how he might be photographing this because oftentimes utopian societies want to build their own society in, in isolation in the landscape. Um, often photography books are in the TR section, which is the technology section, but occasionally you find photographers' works, Larry Sultan among them, Andrew Sternfeld, they're in the humanities section because of the subject matter that they're investigating. And so this uh, isn't this book doesn't come from the technology section where you find photography? Note that photography is not in the art section. <laughs> uh, funnily enough, this book is in the humanities section and it's under the uh, uh, anarchy section of the library category system. Interesting to think about. Interesting to note. Uh, but here we have a title page, and this is a very wide book that I can't completely fit on the camera. But um, talking a little bit about the form of this book, it's, it's published by Steidel. And let me see if I can find the colophon information. Well, I can tell you when it was published based on the call number. 2006 is when this book was published. Um, Steidel. Steidel is a very uh, good publisher, very high quality books, um, very nice paper. So what you have here as far as a format of a book, you have this, it's a horizontal, horizontally oriented book. And um, you have always photograph on the right side and then explanatory information on the left. So this is a lot of information. It's a long, I don't know if you would even call this a title or a caption. What I find so intriguing about this book is that you have a photograph full of rich visual information and descriptive qualities as to what the photograph entails. And then you have uh, this just as interesting information, written information on the left. And so uh, for this picture, you see uh, a man standing in a field um, with some chickens and a little homemade chicken coop. And it gives the title, the place, and the year. And then it describes whatever 
non-traditional or utopian society is being depicted. So this is a acorn community in Mineral, Virginia, and then it has April 2004 for the information. Um, but I think what's so fascinating about this book is it's taken me several days to read through this to really give it the attention that the book calls for. And I love that about photo books, that it's not something you pick up and it's not a magazine. It's not something that you pick up and you glance at and then kind of passively accept information. The photographs kind of draw me in and the writing keeps me. Uh, Writing or titles and photographs, I think, function so well together because they can work in concert. They're complementary. Photographs, uh, John Zarkowski would say, photographs describe everything, but they don't explain anything. They describe everything and explain nothing. And so when you have uh, highly descriptive photographs next to... Um, explanatory text like this, each is free to do their own thing. The, the photograph can be descriptive, it can be interpretive, it can be symbolic, it can be literal, and the text can be, it can be didactic, it can be explanative. Um, so I love this format of a book. And it also encourages or is an example for effective writing by an artist. Um, oftentimes, I think uh, photographers or artists might rebuff at writing or understand the need for, for writing skills when it does nothing but serve your purposes more. This is Alpha Farm, Deadwood, Oregon. And this book um, represents uh, over a decade of work. And what I like about this book is the, the work that went into the writing, of course, but also that um, each photograph could have been an in-depth project of its own. And so here we have Arcad Arcadia Co-Housing, Carborough, uh, North Carolina. This particular uh, attempt at utopia has such a deep history, like all of these do, that you could have a whole year's worth of photo projects in it. Um, and you can dig into just this Arcadia co-housing um, photograph. Take this photograph and make 60 more images about it and publish its own book. But this book is more of a, it's like a, it's a zoomed out collection of a big idea. It's uh, a collection of a bunch of thoughts. And the text points you into the, spe the specif specifications of each thought. So this is one that I think is really interesting. Uh, Paulo Sorari at Arkansanti, Cordes Junction, Arizona, August 2000. So this architect, um, who was a student of Frank Lloyd Wright, has been working for decades on this idea of arcology, a word used by him to describe the harmonious marriage, I'm reading from the text here, of architecture and ecology. Unlike Wright, with whom he studied, Solari believes that it is the physical dispersal in the landscape permitted by the automobile that has led to the moral and spiritual dispersal in society. So the fact that we're all spread out, that we're all kind of isolated, we all have a sense of independence, that we're no longer reliant on each other. Um, so he's critical of excessive consumption of resources to avoid waste in materials, gardens, solar heating, and natural cooling move the community towards self-sufficiency. So he's been working at this town, the city that he's been creating in Arizona for 35 years. He's been funding it himself based on his own societal and environmental and um, architectural philosophies. But here's, here's what makes this book so, um, so clever and dynamic is after reading the text, I don't think people often think this way, but after reading the text, the photograph is more interesting. It doesn't over explain the, in fact, the, 
the details it shares only make you appreciate the photograph more because you know more about it. And I think another interesting facet of this work is that these are complex subjects that he's photographing, and he has the challenge of describing one society in a single photograph. And so I almost, I think an assignment could come out of this is like, um, you have one picture to encapsulate your whole idea, just one picture. And that's what I feel like this book is. It's a collection of different ideas, all brought under the theme of utopia. But he has to describe, you know, whole distinct societies in one photograph. So this is a, an image of Black Mountain College. Um, it was an experiment in communal education in North Carolina. It's very famous. Um, it was most notably um, led or jo Joseph, Joseph Albiers was a huge influence um, and central to Black Mountain College's uh, teaching and art philosophy. So uh, John Cage taught there, Merce Cunningham taught there, Robert Rauschenberg, William Bakunin. But now it is the site, the Black Mountain College went bust. Now it is the site of a Christian sports camp that bought the property. And so you see here a photograph of bleachers and uh, kind of sports equipment um, at the forefront. And then you see in the background a mural that was started in the Black Mountain College days that never got finished. So you see these kind of two two uses, these two histories of the same space. I love that. You know, so he, he's showing two different histories of the same location. This is uh, Elias Rive at Camp, Camp Hill Village, USA, Kapoki, New or nah, if you're from New York, you probably know this, I uh, mispronounced that. Kapoki, New York. Um, and so this is a community that is attracting people with special needs so that they have work um, present in their lives, that they have work and labor as a way of organizing their lives because the people who found this this communal society believe that there's dignity and value in work, um, that it, it, it can fulfill people's lives instead of being an obligation to their lives. And so um, this person who has special needs is still an active participant in their community and they're, they're farming and they're helping things to, to run the show. And here we have this person moving along cattle, uh, but it's social therapy is this uh, uh, form of, I guess you might call medicine or a form of treatment. But I think the best documentary work in photography shows you how interesting and dynamic the world is and how rich it is and how no matter what you see in the news or on headlines, how uh, different we all are and how uh, we each have personal histories that inform our present and how we have so many interesting cultures and societies in this country specifically, but of course globally, that, that make it rich and that each of these places are free to um, live their consciences. They're free to have, they're free to set up these little utopian societies. This is a garden roof. Um, and this article to the left explains how, how negative of an impact these concrete roofs, these flat roofs have in Chicago. And there's attempts um, to put gardens or just grass on top of buildings because it helps to retain water and it keeps buildings up to 20 degrees cooler in the summer. So it keeps buildings cooler, so they don't need so much air conditioning, and it prevents water runoff and flooding. So they kind of catch water. You know, it's, it's you read in this book all the different ways that people, in quite simple ways, are fixing our world. Um, this is really interesting, a city garden in Clybourne, Cleveland Avenue, Chicago. This man set up uh, community gardens and vacant lots that he leases from the city. And when that lease is up or the lot gets sold, he can literally roll up the garden and take it to an, another vacant lot. And uh, he does this in food deserts. And so a community is more self-sustaining. 
of all these, you know, I, I can't imagine how fulfilling this project must have been to photograph because you're, you're going and learning about all these interesting histories that um, maybe you didn't know about beforehand. Just so I don't keep this video too long. Um, let's see if there's any special ones that I want to highlight. Oh, this is a, a really interesting. The, the next two are actually. So this is a photograph of the Hutterite community in South Dakota. The Hutterites were an offshoot of Lutheran's Reformation in the 16th century. And they um, have, since their founding in the 16th century, kind of uh, bounced, have, they've had to have been bounced around from country to country in Europe until they landed in the U.S. And they were always looking for affirmation in their desire at passivity. So they are a Christian fundamentalist religious group that um, believes in passivism. Um, and there are lots of kind of Christian denominations or offshoot groups that believe in pacifism. And they kept bouncing from country to country looking that, or trying to make sure that they would not just be uh, allowed to live there, but not been, uh, not be forced into conscription. And then they finally landed uh, in Canada, um, which wouldn't force, which wouldn't submit them to a draft. And then, um, during the dark days of the Great Depression, Sternfeld writes, the state of South Dakota was in desperate need of tax revenue, and the highly successful Hutterites, whose colonies refused any form of state aid, were invited to reoccupy their former lands in South Dakota. Um, today, 40,000 Hutterites can be found throughout the western United States and Canada, where their remarkably successful communities adopt whatever modern technology they find useful and live according to the beliefs they first embraced in 1525. Uh, this image is uh, a picture made at a homecoming celebration in Nicodemus, Kansas. And uh, after the Civil War, um, Kansas was advertising itself as a place where uh, new, newly freedmen, former slaves, uh, freed African Americans, could come and set up their lives on their own terms now. They could be self-sufficient, that they could create their own destinies, that they weren't reliant on a master or a government for their um, well-being, and to hand, they could handle their own affairs. So you see during Reconstruction, enormous explosion of freedmen towns. There are a lot of them in Florida, there are a lot of them in Kansas, um, and all across the Southeast. But Kansas particularly had a bunch of freed towns that this one being Nicodemus, and over the years, they've all kind of been absorbed into the surrounding towns just because uh, t cities have gotten bigger and towns have gotten bigger. But this is one of those last remaining freed towns, Nicodemus in Kansas, where annually there's a homecoming celebration where African Americans um, from Nicodemus and around Nicodemus come and celebrate their emancipation, but also their self-reliance. So I love this guy's outfit. And his very expensive boots. Beautiful shot. I love the, I love, I think his portraits in this book are the strongest. Reading from Sternfeld. The story of Nicodemus is symbolic of the pioneering spirit of African Americans who participated in every aspect of shaping of the American West. They trapped, led expeditions, and rode for the Pony Express. They also served in the military as Buffalo soldiers a name given them by Native Americans in admiration of their strength, persistence, and durability. But it's such a fascinating book, and it kind of indicates the long history that we have in this country of people wanting to build a better society and how the country facilitates that because of religious liberties and just the freedom to follow your conscience. It's a long, interesting history, and not all of these societies were initially welcomed like the Hutterites. Not all of them stick around. Some of them are political, some of them are social, some of them are economic, and some of them are religious. There's all these different ways that people have structured their lives, um, and it's, it's fascinating to see. So it's a really great book, um, Joel Sternfeld's uh, Sweet Earth. So as we discussed in the book, 
there's a, a large reliance of text uh, in Sweet Earth. The, the photographs in this book are a result of 10 years of Joel Sternfeld photographing. And so they're single photographs that might represent a whole society or a whole philosophical understanding of a landscape. And so Sternfeld has uh, t titles and captions that go with these photographs. What do you think about that? Is it, is it an over-reliance on text? Um, do they go well together, as I uh, um, propose in the, in the photo book review? Um, Sternfeld's a very smart photographer, um, a strong writer, several projects. Uh, several long-term projects on the on the website. You can follow the uh, research below. I've linked publisher's website, artist website, um, uh, and two really interesting Guardian articles on Joel Sternfeld and his work. So yeah, uh, tune in next time. I'll see you soon.